Hello class. Today I'd like to share with you the story of how Drufus the Dragon lost his head. Written and illustrated by Bill Peets. I love the Bill Peets stories. How Drufus the Dragon lost his head. Once upon a time, there lived a family of dragons. They were a horrible bunch of bees who traveled about from country to country, stirring up trouble wherever they went. One day, on a trip to some faraway land, the dragon family flew into a dense fog and Drufus, the youngest of the dragons, lost track of the others. There he is. There he is, all by his lonesome. Drufus kept circling about in the endless gray cloud, calling and calling in a squeaky small voice until at last he was too weary to flap his wings. Then the little dragon gave up and went gliding down to land on a mountainside and crawled into a cave where he curled up in a corner to sleep for the night. And there he is, lying in a corner, going to sleep. Drufus awoke the next, the next morning, feeling very lonely and ever so hungry. So he left his cave to find something for breakfast. Drufus was just four years old. And at that age, dragons feed on small things like grasshoppers and beetles. As he was searching the tall grass near the cave, as he's searching in the tall grass near the cave, he came across a grasshopper struggling helplessly in a spider web. The spider was all set, was all set to pounce when suddenly Drufus snatched the grasshopper out of the web. For a long while, Drufus held the grasshopper by one leg, wondering what to do. How could he eat someone just after saving his life? It didn't seem right, so he finally set the grasshopper free. After Drufus gave up eating grasshoppers and beetles and all other things that hopped or crept or crawled, as much as he disliked it, the young dragon took to eating grass. He became a vegetarian, didn't he? It tastes awful, he said after one mouthful, but I'll just have to get used to it. And sure enough, the more grass he ate, the better he liked it. And sure enough, well, I should say pretty soon, Drufus found the grass so tasty, he was stuffing it down by the fistful. And there are all the animals looking at him eating the grass. And in a surprisingly short time, the grass-eating dragon grew into a giant of a monster, a huge scaly brute with a long pointed tail and big leathery bat wings. There's too much of me now, grumbled Drufus. I'm one big overgrown lunk with nothing to do but eat and sleep. Then he remembered his wings. He hadn't been on a flight since he was four years old, the day he was lost in the fog. Flying might be fun for a change he said, and spreading his wings, he sailed up through the pines, then on out over the countryside. Here he is, flying over the countryside. It was a perfectly, a perfect day for flying. So sunny and clear, he could make out every haystack that dotted the fields far below. He could see cows in the meadows, ducks in the pond, and a cart traveling along a yellow ribbon of this road past the farmhouses. Farther on, 
there were more roads and houses and great clusters of houses with the castle towering above the rooftops. It was the castle of the king, and the king was out on, on the balcony to enjoy the beautiful morning. Great gazootikins, he cried when he caught sight of Drufus. A dragon, a whopper of a dragon. And the king watched in amazement until the dragon had sailed away to disappear in the forest high on the mountainside. What a marvelous thing it would be, he said, to have that giant dragon's head on the wall of the great hall. And the king offered a reward of a dragon golden, um, a hundred golden quadruples for the dragon's head, which was a lot of money in those days. There he was looking out at this, what he called a horrid beast. Well, off they went. That same afternoon, the brave knights in the kingdom rode up the mountainsides in search of the giant dragon. Drufus was resting against a tree when the clumpity clump of horses' hoofs and the clankety clank of armor reached his ears. The two ton dragon was much too weary for his sightseeing trip to go flying again. So he scurried back into his cave to hide. There he is hiding. The knights were looking for a cave with bones scattered about the entrance. But if they had gone all the way into one of them, they would have seen Rufus. After one peek into Drufus's Drufus's cave, they hurried on up, up the mountain up the mountainside, peeking into all the other caves as they went. The knights searched for months, peeking into hundreds of caves, but not one of them had the look of a dragon's cave. So at last, they gave up in despair. The dragon's hideout would have remained a mystery if a lamb hadn't gone astray one evening. The lamb had wandered into the pine forest on the mountainside. And before long, a farm boy came looking for her. Lighting the way with a lantern, the boy followed the lamb's trail. Small bits of wool had caught on the brambles here and there. When he came to the cave, he raised his lantern to peer inside. And he took a look inside and first, Seemed to be nothing in the cave but rabbits. Then, farther back in the dark, he spied a small white blob. It was the lamb. The lamb curled up beside a scaly, pointed dragon's tail. And looming up to the roof of the cave was the rest of the dragon sound asleep and snoring. Here, Flossie. Come on, Flossie, the boy called softly, careful not to awaken the dragon. The lamb finally raised his head, or her head, then hopped to her feet, then came trotting out of the cave. And the boy and the lamb went scampering away through the forest. And here they are, scampering away through the forest. Halfway down the mountain, they met the boy's father. And he was very angry. How many times must I warn you, he growled, to stay out of the woods after dark. But I had to find Flossie, said the boy, and you'd never guess where. She was sleeping in a cave with a dragon. D -d 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 dragon, stammered his father. Uh, are, are you sure? A giant of a dragon, said the boy. Why, son, did you know there's a reward for his head? A hundred gold quadruples. The king's knights have been searching for the mountain for months. If you lead the knights to his cave, I'm sure you will get at least part of the reward. 
I, I can't do that, said the boy. If he wouldn't hurt my lamb, then he must be a good dragon. So I'll never tell anyone where he lives. With nothing to worry about and so little to do, life was getting dull for Drufus, and he decided a change of scenery might help. One day, he said goodbye to his cave and took off on a trip to most anywhere. However, he picked the very worst day for flying, and before he knew it, Drufus was caught in a storm. He wheeled around to head back for, the, for his cave, but it was too late. The fierce wind twisted his neck and tail and ripped off his wings, or ripped out his wings, and sent him tumbling backward into the clouds. The dragon battled the storm. Dill's wings were tattered to shreds. Then, helpless as a butterfly, he went whirling down out of the clouds to land with the earth-shaking kerwomp far out in a field. Uh. Kerwomp. Drufus was badly battered and bruised and couldn't move. was one big hurt from the point of his tail to the spikes of his nose and he lay there sprawled out in the field while the storm went thundering away over the mountains. He heard someone shouting, it's a dragon, the big dragon, I saw him fall. And pretty soon a small boy came running across across the field, followed by a man and a woman. It was the same boy who had been found, who had found the lamb in the dragon's cave. There they are. It's him all right, said the boy after one look at Drufus. He appears to be dead, said his father. What a pitiful thing, said his mother. But he's not dead, cried the boy. He just blinked an eye. I can blink an eye, groaned Rufus, but that's all. I'm just about done for. Are you going to tell the king, the boy asked his father, and collect the hundred quadruples? You found him, son, so that's for you to decide. He's a good dragon, said the boy, and if I take good care of him, he might get well. Drufus was covered with a straw stack to keep him from chilling during the night. And every day, the boy brought him bunches of fresh grass and a tub of fresh water. And every day, the dragon felt a bit better. What makes your father so sad? Asked Jervis one day. Because we're so poor, said the boy. And the reason we are poor is because of all these big rocks. They take up so much room, there's not much land left to growing anything. We've tried every which way to get rid of them, but with everyone on the farm all pulling and pushing at once, we can't budge even one of these rocks. That is enough to make anyone sad, sighed Drufus. Early one morning, long before the ro first rooster crow, Drufus burst out of the straw stack 
feeling as fit as ever and just as good as new, except for his wings. There he is. They were still so badly tattered, they were useless, but the wings didn't matter. Besides, he had better things to do. Seizing the nearest boulder in his powerful claws, he jerked it, he jerked it off the ground, then carried it away to the far end of the field, where he dropped it. Kerplunk! That was easy, said Rufus. The next, the next time, he carried three rocks, then four and five, stacking them all into one pile. Where the poor farmer stepped out of the door of his cottage that morning. And when he saw it, the land was half cleared and he let out a whoop. That could, that could be heard for a mile. Whoop. I told you he was a good dragon, said the boy. He's a great dragon, cried the father, tossing his hat high in the air. Look, and look what he's doing. He's helping us. And there's the stack of rocks. By noontime, Drufus had piled every last rock into one pyramid. At last, the land was clear, and the happy farmer hitched his donkey to a plow and set out across the field. If that's what you call plowing, said the dragon, I can do that too. Jabbing his pointed tail deep in the ground, Rufus went, trotting along, leaving a deep furrow, pulling up weeds and eating them as he went. Well, he used his tail. See, he used his tail to plow the field. After the plowing was done, he helped plant the wheat. He hauled logs from the forest and using his long jagged tail for a saw, he cut enough firewood in one day to last the whole winter. When he ran out of things to do, he stood in the wheat field with his great arms outstretched, serving as a very fine scarecrow. Here he is sawing wood with his tail little spikes on his tail. And now he's a scarecrow, scaring all the birds away from their wheat field. He's worth a lot more than a hundred quadruples, said the happy farmer. He's worth a thousand. But the happiest of all was Rufus. At last, he had become something useful, not just a big lunk of a thing. He no longer worried about the King's knights coming after him. The farm was so far out in the country, hardly anyone knew it was there. The only one too worried about was an old sheep herder who lived somewhere back in the hills. Once every spring, the man drove his ox cart over the bumpy road that ran past the farm on his way to the village to market his wool. The bad-tempered old fellow could be heard shouting at his ox and long before he passed by the farm. So there was plenty of time for Drufus to slip out of sight behind the barn. And there he is, as the man came on his cart. Drufus ran and hid behind the barn. But one spring day, as the ox cart passed by, Drufus was careless and left his long pointed tail sticking out. The old sheep herder knew very well that such a tail could only belong to a dragon. When he reached the village late in the day, the old fella went straight to the castle to tell the king. See, he left his tail out. And he saw, and he went to tell the king. The next day, the king and all his knights came riding up the road to the farm 
on their great war horses armed with swords and lances. Drufus knew they were, there was no hiding, no use hiding. They had heard he was there or they wouldn't have come. So he stood there in the field while the farmer and his son ran out to meet them. We've come for the dragon, said the king, and here's your reward of a hundred golden quadruples. I don't want the reward, said the father, for the farmer. The dragon's not for sale. Come, take the quadruples. I must have his head, said the king. So please stand aside. But he's a good dragon said the boy. He's as tame as a kitten. He even sleeps by my bed every night. Look here, boy, growled the king. I've got no time for foolery. Oh, oh I didn't mean all of him, said the boy. Only his head sleeps by my bed. He sticks his neck through the window and the rest of him stays outside. He sleeps there. Well now, son, that's a bit more like it, said the king. In fact, that gives me an idea, a grand idea. I'll borrow your dragon just for special occasions and I'll pay you 20 quadruples each time. How about that? What do you say to that? It's up to the dragon, said the boy. Make it 30 quadruples, said Rufus. Then 30 it is, said the king. Rufus, Rufus made his first visit to the king's castle. On the eighth day of April, the day of the Grand Spring Festival, people came from miles around, crowding in the Great Hall, which was splendorously bedecked with banners and streams and festoons of flowers. High up on the wall, a giant of a dragon's head appeared through an elegant window framed in gold, a happy, smiling dragon's head that brought cries of surprise and squeals of delight and sent the crowd into a jolly, frolicsome mood. Soon, they were all singing and dancing to the music, the trumpets and flutes, and the spring festival was going full tilt. Here they are, all singing, dancing, making merriment. And there's Jervis the dragon sticking his head out. And there are the trumpets. The dragon was so carried away by all the merriment, he suddenly burst into song with a booming ear-splitting voice that rocked the rafters and drowned out all the trumpets and flutes before he finally caught himself. In all the excitement, Drufus the dragon lost his head, but only for a moment. <laughs> and that's the end. How Drufus the dragon Lost His Head by Bill Peet.